All right, thank you everybody. Welcome to Reinforce. I'm super excited to be here, and thank you to AWS for having me as part of the emerging track. Um, it's been a really awesome opportunity to work with the AWS folks over the years. Uh, I've been working with them for about seven years now on a variety of features from um, my company's perspective, and that's helped to bring things like CloudTrail and key management service and all these cool things to life, which is awesome. All right, so a little bit about me. Don't worry, don't worry. Just come on in. All right, uh, I have been doing uh, technology for a really long time. Started as a developer, kind of transferred over to security because it was cooler. Had to pay the bills with operations, so people used to ship me boxes that I would put Red Hat Linux on. Um, but don't tell anybody because, you know, that would ruin my image. Uh, started doing DevSecOps when basically Agile came into being and it was really difficult to do. Um, and ultimately got to the point where I started working with the Rugged DevOps team and DevSecOps was a thing and Rugged was a thing and we kind of all decided that we're going to do a little bit of both. All right, and also I'm big into STEM, like to write comics, uh, do a whole bunch of cool stuff. I work for Intuit, I run their red team, uh, and I'm one of the founders of DevSecOps.org, and uh, if you've seen things like DevSecOps Days, a lot of the stuff that we've been pushing on is to help bring uh, security into the DevOps movement. How many people here are developers? Come on, must see security folks from you putting your hands up, come on. All right, yeah, I know, I was gonna have half. Security? Most of the audience, yes, yeah, we're reinforced, cool. Um, operations? I know you're out there. Yeah, 24 by seven, ringing a bell, cool. All right, I do that because I wanna basically have everybody understand a little bit about what I'm talking about today, so it helps me. Uh, real quick shout out to the folks at dearauditor.org. Um, if you haven't seen this, you should really check it out. It's basically a uh, movement by the DevOps folks that realized that they left security out and auditors and a whole bunch of other folks, and so they have been putting controls together um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, if you have a chance, go there. They're uh, taking pull requests, so if you see something you don't like, you can actually change it. So here's our agenda today. We're gonna talk a little bit about the situation, so I can bring everybody along. We're gonna talk about implementation, or innovation, and then implementation and extension. Um, you'll see as we go, I'm trying to make this consumable. Uh, I have a lot of stories, there's a lot of one word slides, so hopefully we can kind of move the pace along. I'm gonna leave some time for the end for some questions, and um, primarily to help talk a little bit about securability and why it's important. So, uh, all right, so the situation, not this kind of situation. Apparently somebody pulled a joke on me and decided to add this in. Um, you know, the situation, right? Everybody knows that, no? Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna try and not be too funny, but just modestly funny. Um, this is a Wardley map. I started doing Wardley maps a long while ago. If you're not familiar with Simon Wardley, you should be. As security practitioners, this helps you tell the future. Uh, that can be a really helpful and useful skill. If you're developers, this can also help you tell the future of what security gonna, is gonna do. Um, and why is this important to you? Well, the answer is, is that basically the cloud has shifted a whole lot of stuff and uh, there's actually a bunch of connectivity between uh, the problem space. And really, traditional security has been pushed in a direction which is to evolve. Um, and I think that you'll find that a lot of the things that are commoditized uh, over on this side of the chart right here is really driving some of the things that are starting to emerge. So security's got a lot of emerging capabilities, which is why I'm super excited to be here at the emerging track because uh, over the years, we've done a lot of commoditization in our company to try and move security to the left, and uh, we've been relatively successful at that. Uh, agile, anybody want to admit to being agile? Yeah, yeah, that's iteration, right? Security and iteration, they go hand in hand, right? Everybody's really excited about iterating on their security, maybe failing a little bit, not so much. Yeah, they told me at one point, we're gonna do Agile, and I said, that's great. What do you mean Agile? We have to actually figure out how to be perfect at security. Um, and that starts to cause the evolution to happen, and ultimately, Agile brought the cloud on, 
cloud is pretty cool. We're all here at a cloud conference. There's thousands of people here. There's, if you've been to reInvent, you've seen even more thousands of people. You've probably have had a hard time trying to get on the bus, uh, get food. It's actually kind of nice here. I feel like they finally carved out something for the security people. And by the way, we all like to wear button-down shirts and kind of like, it's pretty quiet. Usually you go to reInvent and it's pretty crazy. Um, but the cloud has brought a lot of innovation. We're all here because there's so much innovation happening in our companies. And um, with that has brought high blood pressure and speed, right? <laughs> We're all excited. My blood pressure's only gone up a few notches. Um, I don't think it's there because I think I would have stroked out, but I, I remember that number when I was having my child. Um, and it was around the time that we were trying to do a lot of interesting things in the cloud, so there's a little bit of correlation for me. Um, but ultimately, if you're being driven to do more speed, then, well, you probably know a lot of things about DevSecOps. You're starting to hear about that. There's a bunch of great uh, talks here that are around DevSecOps. I would totally tell you, you need to go to those. Take a look, see what you see, and hopefully a lot of you are practicing it. So what's that all mean to us? We're all trying to do DevSecOps. We're trying to put security into DevOps. We're trying to put DevOps into security. It's kind of like peanut butter and chocolate. It's kind of, it'll taste good at the end. Um, but it's hard to put together, and a lot of the things that you have to do to innovate are really difficult. Along the way, we've seen a lot of things. Anybody heard of Shift Left? Yeah, Shift Left. I wrote an article on it. It's kind of cool. Um, shifting left is interesting because a lot of people think that putting your scanners into the CI CD pipeline is shifting left. But not really. It's actually finding problems earlier and figuring out how to make them go away. That's actually what Shift Left is. But we're still emerging as a capability, right? So security is starting to emerge. Why is that important? Well, Shift Left looks a lot like this. You know, back when I started working with uh, AWS from a security perspective, a lot of these things weren't on here. We had IAM. That was cool. We didn't have really a lot of things that we needed. IAM needed to have MFA. It needed to have a whole bunch of stuff. Key management service, anybody using it? Probably everybody's using it. Secrets manager, you should be using it. If you're not yet, you should be checking those out. All of these are our shift left capabilities that are built into the cloud. They're native. That means that a lot of companies like mine, like yours, don't actually have to build these things anymore. And that's amazing. That means that we're moving faster. It means that you don't have to innovate as much to try and do these things. So where's the space to left to be emerging, right? Um, so imagine you're looking at all this stuff and you're figuring out, all right, so people are using it in your company. Does that make your stuff secure? Anybody? Yeah? You good? Well, it turns out that if you want to actually manage something, you got to measure it. So once upon a time, um, there was a pointy-haired boss who said, we need complete test coverage and security. Does anybody know what complete security test coverage is? Because if you do, I want to talk to you afterwards. I'm going to tell you, trying to figure out what the bad guys are going to do before they do it, it's really rough. I mean, extremely rough. And then on top of it said, hey, by the way, and I want metrics too. All right, blank stares, right? You ready? What metrics are you guys all using? Are we talking about like code coverage? Are we talking about, what, what are we talking about, right? So if you want to actually do this, sure. You'd say that to somebody like me. Sounds hard, no one else is doing it. All right, sure, no problem. Let's invent some stuff. So um, along the way, you kind of get sort of interested in what this pointy head boss is going to tell you to do. And uh, you think about it for a minute and realize this is really hard, holy crap. And you bang your head, because that's what I'm famous for, is banging my head against the wall for the last seven years. And I've, if you've come and seen me at any of the other talks, you've seen me bang my head against the wall for many years, hopefully sharing and bringing everybody else along with that journey. Um, so I'm going to try and bang my head a little bit on measurement today. People are interested in kind of doing securability, so we'll talk about that. So innovation, we're gonna to innovate together now. I'm gonna tell you the story of innovating on security metrics. By the way, this is within the last year I've been doing this research. And by the way, I've gone out to a lot of companies, I've talked to a lot of folks, I've talked to uh, the software institutes that are out there that are trying to do measurement, I've looked at every book that's out there, so I'm feeling like I've kind of got a little of it covered. Now, I'm not going to say I'm a great expert at it, but there's definitely some stuff out there. Now, it would not be a DevSecOps talk without Pete Cheslock. Now, I remember back in the day when he heard about DevSecOps, this was how he thought about DevSecOps. And to be honest with you, there's a lot of garbage pictures in some of my other securability talks. And by the way, if you're building software and you're not actually 
doing the things that you need to be doing, then you're actually building garbage. Um, and so I kind of, this, this is appealing to me. I kind of get it. Now, I will tell you that there's another talk that I gave at LastCon a while back, and this image got refactored for Pete because he actually got it wrong. Um, instead of you know, having a janitorial service, I told him, make the um, unicorn eat better food. And ultimately, that will just produce biodegradable poop. You won't need me anymore. So uh, that's kind of a little bit of what we're thinking about. Measurement requirements. Who wants to do measurement, right? Actionable, common, familiar, simple, durable. So developers told me this was their requirements for security metrics. And I was like, huh, you want something you can use for security? Wait, this is what security people need. Security people want the metrics. They don't actually want developers to have metrics for security. They want their own metrics. I'm like, give me my metric back. Um, but ultimately, it turns out for DevSecOps to work, we actually have to give some metrics away. Lots of them, actually. And we have to tell stories about them, and we have to make them actionable. And by the way, actionable security metrics, anybody who's figured that out, please come see me. I really do need your help still. Um, and by the way, common security folks don't actually know how developers actually measure their stuff. Anybody here? I got a great education from a friend of mine at work who talked about TP99, top percent 99. It was really cool. Apparently, developers use it. They actually measure how fast their stuff loads. They talk about their availability, everything as a top percent, which was really an interesting eye-opener uh, eye for me. So in 1976, there was a uh, paper that was written by the military. It was called the Illides. Anybody think that security was included? Because it wasn't. It was actually an afterthought. It was included as safety. In fact, they actually talked about security as being a integrity or confidentiality problem. And in 1976, that kind of makes sense because we really didn't even understand firewalls. There weren't a lot of hackers. Oh, there might have been hackers, but nobody actually knew. Uh, nobody was talking about it. And unless you're talking about it, it doesn't exist. So back then, there actually weren't any hackers. Um, so in the Illides, uh, as they were talking about it, security was a thing. And we kind of have had all of our developers talk about Illides for a really long time. So they do availability, performance, or I forget what it is with performability, um, reliability. So they've got all these illities, right? Quality has basically spawned itself into this illities paper. And illities is such a big deal for a developer that if you're missing it from a security perspective, then ultimately you're not going anywhere. So this is how they think about illities. Five nines, right? Back when we started talking about five nines, I remember when the internet was born. Um, that means I'm really old, and it means that I actually saw less than five nines when it first got started. Back then, if the internet was down, it could have been down for a week. And nobody cared, because they weren't doing anything with it. You were looking at some web pages. Remember the web pages with the little spinny icons? Man, my page was up, and it was running, and it had spinny icons, and it was cool. And it was dark, and had a lot of like turquoise writing, and it was really ugly. Um, but I had a few people come, like two. Uh, and they were actually okay when it was down because it actually sucked pretty bad. But ultimately, I remember also getting my first job when I worked, worked on the internet. And these five nines really mattered because we supported a whole bunch of people who wanted broadband. And they wanted to have fast internet. And the way in which they operated their stuff, they didn't want to be down. In fact, it was actually storefronts. And they said, every time I'm down, I actually lose money. So could you people keep my stuff up? And you get the five nines, right? So by the way, five nines actually extended to all sorts of things, not just availability. And it turns out that people wanted it up all the time. They don't want anything to go down. They don't want anything down for more than a few microseconds, apparently. So what does that translate into for security? I mean, we're talking about bug-free, right? You don't, want your you don't want your developers to find their bugs. You want the people that are actually using your software to find them, right? No, actually, I got that wrong. It's actually the opposite. Turns out that. Fast is something, available is something, and then you get into this weird confidentiality thing. How do you get five nines with confidentiality? Anybody? Integrity? Hmm? I don't know. What's integrity, really? I mean, are we talking about you want to actually make sure that your stuff works and you want to make sure that it actually is right and correct? Okay. So, what is the five nines for security? Can we do five nines? Anybody going to say that they've got the five nines figured out? 
Remember that part where I said complete test coverage? You're going to figure out what developers have to worry about when it comes to attackers. Attackers are going to actually get outsmarted by all of us, right? Turns out with the cloud, you might be able to get closer because if one person knows, apparently our cloud providers are going to fix it and we're all going to benefit, right? It's kind of cool. It's got a communal aspect. So the word security, it's just kind of a noun these days, right? It's not really an actionable thing. Turns out that securability, the capability of being secure, making your workload secure, talking about the capability of making your workload secure is actually really inspiring for a lot of folks and a lot of developers. And why is that? Well, because the capability of putting security into your workload is actually pretty tough and you can't get it perfect and security is not a noun anymore. And by the way, you can iterate and you can give yourself a break. So securability becomes a thing that's actually really empowering. So what's it look like? Is it this? Is it the number of exploits over the number of tests you run? Anybody know how many thousands of tests are in their scanners? You're going to have to enumerate it to get to a metric, right? So now the first thing we're going to ask all of our scanner vendors is, I need to have a securability metric. I need to actually know how many tests are run. And by the way, I need to know against what resource, right? Um, or do we just do this flat metric and we say, hey, here's kind of what it is, go. Here, developers, run tests, figure out which ones are going to get exploited. Anybody understand how many exploits they have per day, per minute? What about your CI CD pipelines? Anybody? You're running stuff all through the day. You're ready to break your build, right? Developers are ready to break their build, right? Just a question. What if I told you that securability looks a little bit like the reverse of exploitability. Huh. How many pen testers in the audience? You guys are king. You're going to be king. If you're not king yet, you're going to be king. And by the way, the reason why is because it turns out that if you can figure out what to exploit beforehand and you shift it left, apparently this number is really important. It can start to produce some nines. And when you reverse exploitability, because by the way, we all want to talk about exploitability. We're a bunch of security folks. We want to talk about how many things that we pwn, because we're cool, right? When you give out something to a developer, if you give out a defect to a developer, you always want to say how cool you are at the very top. You don't want to tell them how to fix it until the very bottom, right? No, we actually do the opposite. We put all of the things that they need to fix something at the very top. We talk about how cool we are and how much exploitability there is at the bottom. But it turns out if somebody actually puts that into their metrics every day, they become accountable for it. Turns out that if a developer actually cares about their securability, they're going to get better at it. What if I told you that securability is actually more like this, your exploited targets over your total exploited, exploitable uh, vulnerabilities or opportunities? Um, what if I told you that, by the way, you could actually figure those things out? You know how many resources you have. A lot of people run Nmap. Or they have compliance, or they have a CMDB. Now, I'm not going to say your CMDB is like perfect, and I'm not going to tell you that this is going to be a perfect number to begin with, but I will tell you that this is an emerging track, which means numbers like this are going to start to matter, and the reason why you need to have them is to create accountability within your organization in common language. So if this is the beginning of that innovation, and I know you're all skeptical, um, what's it kind of look like? So imagine if you were looking at this graph. Imagine if you were looking at something that told you every month how you were doing. Imagine for a moment if you were actually looking at something and saying, hey, by the way, I have a bunch of open exploits right now, and my developer can actually see what it looks like. And they can start to have conversations about being down from a security perspective. Because ultimately, a security outage is a big deal. And by the way, that security outage thousands of things that you actually have to measure, lots of tests, lots of things to worry about. It's actually quite interesting. There's a lot of correlation when you actually have an auto scale group that goes down and all of a sudden your targets actually go up. What's going on? You can actually ask those questions. So this number can be really powerful. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about implementation because you know it's not enough to just talk about the top level stuff, the innovation. Um, and I think securability is a big deal, and the reason why is because there's really nothing else that I've found so far in my journey yet, 
And by the way, there's a whole bunch of numbers I could tell you about. There's lots of experimentation, tons of failure, tons of failure at trying to make something that's useful for a developer. And ultimately, I'm also a developer, which means I want to figure out how much do I have to pay attention to security? And what if it is an infinitesimal issue? What if we find out that security done well is actually we're dealing with a lot of percentages, but in an interesting way? So I know that that five nines thing is interesting, right? We all want the five nines of security, maybe even 100%, because by the way, I think even 0 .001 might still be something that most of us can't tackle. Um, I know you're skeptical, that's right. Everybody's gotta have a cat picture in their security talks, we all know this. Um, I thought he was really, really pissed off, it was a great picture. But you know, I think that as a skeptic, you've got the right frame of mind because the things that we're trying to push on with some sort of metric is that we're actually trying to shape DevSecOps. You're trying to shape your um, overall program. You're trying to shape what you say in accountability. And you're ultimately trying to move people forward. So what if I told you that the industry average is around 1 in 531? Anybody? Kind of cool? Want to know where I got that number? So apparently, and I've done a whole bunch of studying, and by the way, it's not necessarily one in 531. There's a whole bunch of other likelihoods that you could put into here. And you could do one in a million. You can do all kinds of things. Uh, one in 531 actually represents the number of malware samples that come into email. So for every 531 emails you have, you probably have a malware sample around every 531. That means that a lot of us that get thousands of email a day, we have potentially a lot of malware in our stuff. And it also means that you might want to set up a honeypot to go finding these malware samples because they could be really interesting and very useful. And that actually turns into 99.8. I just said it, 99.8. Does everybody know what 0.8 means? That means there's a lot of security problems that are going um, into your systems that are actually not getting dealt with. And if that's the running number for most companies is 99.8, it means you're actually having security outages on a continuous basis that need to be dealt with. And that's an empowering and impactful number because um, if you were to say 99.8 to a developer, guess what they're going to think? Oh my God, I have an outage. I need to deal with that. And by the way, when we give them this number, it is impactful. So what's it also mean? It means that, by the way, we have to share data. So if you're going to actually implement a metric system, you better be sharing a whole lot of data. Um, I think I'm nearing 10 petabytes worth of data, and that's a whole lot of data. Raw alerts, we're, we're correlating, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff with this data. Uh, our red team likes to use the data to actually find out where we can exploit stuff, so it's a really powerful competitive advantage to all the bad guys that are out there. Um, and if you're not thinking about it that way, maybe you should be. And the reason why is because developers can give you this information, and when they give it to you, you should do something with it. So if you're a security practitioner, instead of just coming and showing a bunch of insights, you want to go back and figure out, like, what are you doing with it? Raw data can be really useful for things like um, forensics. And you might have insights that you want to share with a developer, and building those is really critical. So what's 99.999 look like? Two things, two dimensions. Resources and test coverage. I know it doesn't seem that innovative, but by the way, it's actually pretty innovative. Because when I said earlier that they wanted 100% test coverage, how do you get there? There's a lot of things that are happening in these two dimensions right now in the industry, but they're not really being thought about just yet in this way. So when you talk about resource coverage, there's a lot of technology now that's being born. There's a starting to be more test coverage capabilities. In fact, there's actually things like code graphing that are starting to emerge in security. And emerging capabilities have to have a frame. So what do you do with resource coverage? You're going to find, catalog, and track. Uh, if you're going to find stuff, you actually have to go through the effort of finding these resources. You can do that in AWS, by the way. There's a whole bunch of reasons why it's a great place to be. Um, and it's much harder to do in a data center. So how do I find these resources? Well, there's a lot of ways. EIP is really interesting. Basically, it's an external, internal, and privilege. And what you see here is basically an extension of the kill chain. Anybody using the kill chain? There's probably a few people using the kill chain. Um, and if you're not using the kill chain, you might be using some other method like NIST and ISO and a whole bunch of other stuff. And um, by the way, you should be actually cataloging your capabilities through things like network compute storage. That's starting to look kind of AWS-like, right? They've had a lot of uh, uh, success around trying to organize this way. 
So building stuff from the standpoint of external, internal, and privileged is really helpful. And the reason why is because you're actually now starting to look at things like, um, I don't know, uh, your blast radius. Anybody heard about blast radius? That can be really powerful and critical. What about how do I catalog, do attack surface modeling? Um, this is actually an interesting thing for you to do. Go through your application, start to enumerate them this way. Why? Because when you enumerate them this way, you're actually putting them into the same frame of reference as the developer's going to have. Because as they're building something, they're actually thinking about privilege. They're thinking about their web app. They're thinking about how they're going to actually organize their stuff and make it available for it to perform and its reliability. So how do you track resources in AWS? Well, we know that DynamoDB can be really interesting. Uh, you can start to enumerate some of this. You can pull out from your AWS SDK, push it into a DynamoDB database, and start to pull together that instrumentation for resources. Or you can shift over to config. Lots of people are now using config. Config rules has just recently gotten new um, pricing. And as you've gone along for doing some of this, you actually have um, around 80-something config rules. And by the way, they're doing better every day. And we could start to build these capabilities, but reality is it's truly t uh, terrifying to try and figure out exactly what you're going to do with all this resource data and actually make something useful with it. But if you build into their capabilities, it can actually help you to enumerate on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, all this information so that you have resources at your disposal. We built something called Recon a long while back, and that's actually what inspired some of Config. And Config actually has become very useful with rules. So let's talk a little bit. Let's switch over from resources to test coverage. And there's a reason why I'm switching over, and you're going to see, if you're not mapping some of this in the right way, you're going to have a hard time with securability because you've got to get your exploits and your exploitable opportunities actually aligned in a way that makes it so that this metric comes together. Um, so you're going to frame, map, and advance. Now, what do I mean by that? Anybody ever seen the security hierarchy of needs? It's really an empower empowering thing. And what I mean by this is you have the ability now to give your developers a method to fix 80% of the problems without having to give them 300 pages. You can give them guardrails and guidelines. And by the way, this is the coolest thing about this kind of model. You can actually iterate on it. It, be it becomes something that developers can use right away. It becomes five things they have to worry about. You can go through the process of enumerating them from your hand. You can say, all right, I know what I got to do. And developers can make this easy sets of choices that'll become something that you can use within your metrics. Now, with this kind of hierarchy of needs, you can assemble a lot more information about your test coverage and your resources, it turns out. So you're going to map your resources to the test framework. Basic, moderate, and advanced. Basic testers, right? Anybody got any basic testers? We all know that most of your scanners are probably doing a lot of basic testing. Um, your moderate capabilities. So we lined up a lot of the AWS capabilities to try and figure out what our resources were going to look like so that we could start to map out how we were going to red team them. And what I mean by that is, yeah, we do a lot of stuff like breaking in, and we figure out what we're going to do with that, and then we try to actually create a bunch of campaigns. And that becomes the beginning of your test framework. And if you map your test framework over um, with your tests, so you have your resources and your tests together, and you map them over using that same thing, um, it turns out that you can start to enumerate your tests in the same way that you can your resources. Um, that becomes really interesting. Anybody know what a subdomain takeover is? Yeah, anybody? Yeah, they're really actually pretty scary. And if you haven't got those figured out yet, there's something you should be working on. You can use config and config rules to actually fix those types of things. But you won't necessarily see it until you line up your resources and your tests so that you can actually enumerate these things and figure out what you're going to test with what particular resource. Now, so that tells you for every uh, domain name, you may have one test, right? So what if you had 300 domain names? With one test, you actually have 300 opportunities, 300 exploitable opportunities that could be taken over at any given time. And so, by the way, every time you test those, if you find one, you've actually started to got, get a hang on securability. So the next thing to think about is, how do I narrow down my exploitable opportunities? Inspector can be really interesting. Um, who's actually running Inspector? 
Yeah, there's some good stuff there. Uh, and by the way, if you're not running it, you should be. And the reason why is it's super easy to run. It can run and give you information. They're making it better all the time. And what's interesting about this is actually when you start to map the data into that security hierarchy of needs, you can determine, all right, let's do a real quick back of the napkin. Um, zoning and containment. Do I have a problem with zoning and containment? You can now teach your developers using zoning and containment and your testing and your resources to be able to give them examples, give them a five nines example of what it means to measure it, and go through that process. And it looks a little bit like this. If you're going to focus on exploits, what if there's very few exploitable opportunities? What if you go through this process to find out that hygiene will actually cause security to degrade if you don't pay attention to it? And over time, what does happen is a bunch of people like my team go through the process of figuring out, hey, that if you didn't patch that particular issue and there's no exploit out there, maybe we'll actually weaponize it. We'll go through the process of bringing that to life. And now you're starting to shift left because you're finding that a lot of this information can be really useful on campaigning and figuring out where you're going to weaponize and actually prove these things out. Um, as part of the process, you're going to see a lot of tests that actually don't have a lot of impact on your securability. So you've got to divide them out. You want to find out which ones are actually really important and which ones are actually emerging so that you can divide out what's important for somebody to fix right now and what can be done over time. Why is that important for a developer? It's because of regression testing. So if you're a developer, you're going to say, hallelujah, thank God she actually said regression testing. Because most developers want the time back to figure out how to make their software resilient, but not just because of security. They want to be able to test their stuff, push it through the pipeline, and make sure it's going to work when it comes out. So by saving them from having to fix things right now and getting that regression number to come up, it becomes impactful. So extension. All right, so we've gotten through implementation. And by the way, there's a whole bunch here that I could actually go through, and it would take hours and hours to really go through the meat and potatoes of securability. But I'm going to talk a little bit about extension, security hierarchy of needs. There's a whole bunch that can be broken down here. You can actually get into things like perimeter controls. You can go through and catalog all of those compliance requirements against the hierarchy of needs. And that means that you can actually test them just like you test everything else. And you can compare compliance to exploit. And you can talk about shifting somebody left from an exploitability perspective. And that means that over time, you can look at things like, how is my hygiene reducing the amount of exploitability in my workloads? And by doing this kind of measurement, you allow yourself to be able to plan ahead. How do we make security less surprising? This is kind of it. It's one of the things that you can do to make it so that you understand. And by the way, we said, ultimately, to get to test coverage, we had to figure out how we're going to make it so that developers can think about what bad guys could be doing. If you give them a framework, if you give a developer a framework, you can kind of figure out what things are going to be a problem. How many people think that inputs and outputs is one of the biggest problems that we have in the industry? Inputs and outputs validation is by far one of the biggest things that we have to conquer, and it lives inside of zoning and containment. It, it turns out that if you don't do inputs and outputs validation well, you might as well not even worry about authentication. I know we have a lot of folks in here probably who'd like to do a lot of IAM, but I'm going to tell you, if you leave a cross-site scripting vulnerability out there, an XXE, some sort of other exploitable capability, forget about authentication. You might as well just like leave it off because it's such an important piece of the puzzle. So the other thing to think about is, why is this stuff happening? So if we thought back to what we looked at for this particular metric, and we start to realize that we have exploited targets and exploitable opportunities, it turns out that there is correlation between these numbers. Sometimes when you have a low number of exploited targets, you may still have a high number of exploitable opportunities. And by the way, that probably means you're getting lucky. Because a lot of exploitable opportunities means you don't really have zoning and containment locked. It means that you might have thousands and thousands of resources, hundreds of thousands of resources. Some companies even have millions that are available from the internet. Think about all your laptops that are walking around. Those are actually exploitable opportunities just being waiting to be had. And other things like high exploit targets but low numbers of opportunities. It may mean that you're actually not dealing with hygiene. 
And these insights can be impactful for a security perspective, from a security perspective because it means that security folks can be looking at this data and they can be looking at what's happening in the workload and start to share a little bit more about what it means to make something safe. So I'm going to go back here for a minute and talk a little bit about extending this. So if you wanted to get into the meat and potatoes of securability, really when that particular number of assets, that resource number drops, in July, and all of, a secure sense, uh, all of a sudden, securability is much lower, doesn't that kind of give you a pause? Why would it be all of a sudden that that happened? Well, it turns out that maybe with a lot more exploitable opportunities, you may have not necessarily seen it. So all of a sudden, an auto-scale group goes off, and all of a sudden, you see that actually your exploitability is much different than you thought it would be. Um, and that can help you to understand what you're trending and tracking. And by the way, there's lots of ways for you to look at securability and dive into it. When you see these kinds of things, you can actually now pull it apart. You might have an exploitability problem during an auto scale event where a security group actually got screwed up. And by the way, even though the number went down, that became something that made you more, less secure, even though you would think that when we lower our number of opportunities, we might actually not have a problem. This could tell you a lot about your workloads. Um, another thing to think about is where, when you're using something like the security hierarchy of needs, or even if you develop your own framework, going through the process of figuring out during design, if I think about my zoning and containment, will I have a problem? If I wait too late in the process and actually put asset management in my code, maybe I'm actually not thinking about my libraries and the way in which I'm dealing with my libraries. Anybody using Nes uh, Nexus, IQ Server, Sonatype, Artifactory, any of those products? Those are the things that you should be thinking about. Your developers are thinking about what library they're going to use next, how they solve a problem. This can be a really interesting thing for them to understand that instead of putting it towards code, maybe they move up the stack and start to design in which libraries they should be using because that's going to make their workload safer. Now, I'm going to leave you with one last piece here on extension, and I'm going to then leave a few minutes for uh, talk uh, through some questions if you have any. Um, really, securability, adversary interest, and SLA multipliers. Um, if you want to extend your securability, you should be thinking about adversary interest. What does that mean? It means that on the targets that you get, so not just your exploitable opportunities, but the targets, meaning those exploits that are out there, do you have adversary interest? Because when adversary interest spikes, you might actually have a compromise happening. And that's a really insightful piece of information because as you track something like this, you can start to determine when should we be getting ahead? How do we actually get ahead of bad guys? And SLA multipliers, if you notice, all of a sudden the SLA multiplier kind of went up around the same July time frame. It may mean that there's something going on in your company around its SLAs where it's actually having a hard time trying to deal with maybe a design flaw or some sort of way in which somebody built something that's actually now being passed around because nobody copies and pastes anything, right? Um, all of a sudden, you can have something that helps you with the markers that are going to get to the root and ultimately the root cause of why security problems happen. And so from an emerging standpoint, this is really how we're going to start making headway with DevSecOps. It's going to be how we actually make it so that developers get the benefit of security professionals, is that the science has to become something that helps them to get insights and make use of it and ultimately push this forward. Um, I think SLA multiplier is one of the most unique things that I've seen in this journey. And the reason why is because it turns out that developers leverage SLA multiplier quite often. And the reason why they actually use SLA multiplier is it helps them to determine when they've got a lot of things that are in the way, they can actually look and say, I'm kind of 3x SLA. That can tell me that even though I'm 3x, I'm not 50x, I'm still putting time towards it, but it actually becomes something that helps you to understand, do I have a feature or something that's going to have to get done? How do I balance my priorities? And um, if you stay within range, so by the way, these are all control charts. If you wanted to see a really great control chart, keep them in some band, some narrow band, and actually put control limiters on your highs and lows. And this can be a really impactful number that can be shared 
And by the way, I haven't found another one, but I'm totally interested in everybody else's stuff that's out there. And the reason why something like this can actually change an industry is that securability can ultimately become something that developers understand. It becomes their TP99. It helps them to understand that if they've got defects that are out there, they find them faster, they fix them faster. That can actually change the safety of their workloads. And so I've spent a lot of my career going through this process, trying to figure it out. I have done a ton of metrics information out there. And um, some of the ways in which we actually have to change how we think about securing things has to come from mathematics. We have to find a way to ultimately get past the subjectivity of our control base to be able to figure out how to make it so that we know with more objectivity that, in fact, developers are building safer stuff. So if you're interested, I've got um, some projects that I'm working on. I always need help. If you've got stories, if you've got all kinds of things that you might be thinking about, this is absolutely an opportunity for you to contribute. Uh, we're working on a book. Uh, I've got some co-authors. We're basically trying to pull in more stories for the DevSecOps handbook. And um, you know, I, I look forward to working with you guys if you're interested. Uh, I want to take some questions, so you know, thank you for anybody who came to the talk. And if you've got questions, I'd be happy to help.